Welcome to today's episode of the Normalized Surrogacy Podcast by Surrogacy Mentor. I'm your host, Carrie Flamer Powell, experienced gestational surrogate, surrogacy agency founder, and owner of Surrogacy Mentor and Modern Parent Mentor, where our aim is a safe, ethical, and enjoyable surrogacy journey for all. Today, I am excited to be joined by our very special guest, Dr. Susanna Park of San Diego Fertility Center. Welcome, Dr. Park. Hi, Carrie. Thank you. Glad to be here. Absolutely. So excited to have you. So today we are talking about what fertility clinics wish that you knew, including medical screening, embryo transfers, bed rest, and more. So (laughs) we have lots to talk about and lots that I know people are interested in hearing from you about. So before we dive into all of that, let me share a little bit of information about Dr. Park. So again, introducing Dr. Susanna Park, a trailblazing fertility physician whose journey has led her from the prestigious halls of Columbia University in New York City to the forefront of reproductive medicine at the San Diego Fertility Center. With a decade of experience at Columbia University, Dr. Park honed her skills in infertility treatment before embarking on a new chapter in San Diego in 2012. There, she seamlessly blends her extensive expertise with a deeply personalized approach to patient care, striving to optimize success for each individual. Dr. Park's dedication and innovation have earned her the esteemed title of Top Fertility Doctor from San Diego Magazine an incredible six times. This recognition holds special significance as it's given by local physicians who trust her with the well-being of their patients and their very own family members. Born in Seoul, South Korea, and raised in Buenos Aires, Argentina, Dr. Park's multicultural upbringing equips her to provide compassionate care in English, Korean, and Spanish, fostering strong connections with diverse communities. So that's an amazing bio. (laughs) Thank you. So amazing. Yes. And the three languages, that's awesome. i keep telling myself before I'm 50, I need to learn at least one other language besides English. So that's incredible. So we're so excited to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. So why don't we just dive right into our topic today? And let's talk about let's start with um, medical screening for surrogates. So um, a lot of our listeners are either surrogates currently, surrogates previously, or women interested in becoming surrogates. And then we also have intended parents who are listening that kind of want to understand a little bit more of when people say, oh, your surrogate needs to be properly screened from a medical perspective. What does that even mean? What are you looking for? Yep. So first, for all those women who have been or are thinking of being surrogates, really, thank you, right? It is It is really a gift that you're giving to others. And I loved being pregnant and I was pregnant twice and I would love to be a surrogate if if I, but I've aged out now. (laughs) And it's just so heartwarming to see there's so many women out there who truly want to give this gift to others. Mm -hmm. But as much as all these women may want to, all these women may not be medically qualified to do so. So Mm -hmm. there's some just basic requirements, but then there are more requirements on top of this. But the basic requirement is a surrogate must have been pregnant. Okay, so right. that, and it's interesting how sometimes I speak with intended parents and um, they don't realize that. And I tell them, unless it's your friend or family member, a surrogate from an agency must have been pregnant in the past mm-hmm. and must have had an uncomplicated pregnancy. Right. So, We want the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, which is our national organization, has these recommendations, which is we want a surrogate to have been pregnant five or less times. They deliver, let me emphasize, five or less deliveries. So if she was pregnant, she had a miscarriage, that does not count. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of those five or less deliveries, three or less cesarean sections. Okay, so it's okay that she had a vaginal delivery, then a vaginal delivery, then a C-section, C-section, C-section. It's still okay. Right. I think where things start to get a little bit of a gray zone is what's considered 
like uncomplicated. Right. Okay. And I think it's very important that when these surrogates put in their application that everybody understands you are not a healthcare professional, but just do your best to be as complete and honest when filling out the application. Right. Because if you know in your pregnancy, boy, you had really bad blood pressure problems in that most recent pregnancy, and you don't know it, it will come out upon review of the records. And if it was really that severe, you will likely not be approved to be a surrogate. Mm -hmm. And so that process could have been stopped much earlier as opposed to much later in the process. Right. Yes. Yeah. In addition to that, there's also just overall health. A full medical history is taken just to make Mm -hmm. sure that medically you're healthy. For example, let's say you have a significant heart history. Well, I understand that for your own family, perhaps you're willing to take the risk, but to put you at risk for somebody else's family with a significant heart history really makes most physicians pause that, oh, I don't know if this is worth the risk. Right. Okay? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So then in addition to medical history, there's also a surgical history. And most surrogates don't have a very significant surgical history that would somehow exclude them from being a surrogate. Mm-hmm. And then there are also medications that you're taking. And then stop and think, gosh, of these medications, how many do I really need? Because mm-hmm. I think many times people just take medication because they've been taking it for so long. But this is a great time to pause and say, do I really need all these medications? Mm-hmm. Let me eliminate the ones that, you know, I don't think I need anymore. Right. Okay? Mm-hmm. And then, of course, thinking socially, surrogates cannot be smoking. Mm-hmm. During the process, we don't want you drinking alcohol and certainly no drug use. Right. In terms of occupation, There are some occupations that may give some intended parents pause. Mm -hmm. For example, let's say you are an x-ray technician and you're exposed to x-ray on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And you you will force at work, you wear a shield, right, to try to minimize the amount of radiation your body absorbs. There may be Mm -hmm. some intended parents out there who may just be a little bit nervous having that type of surrogate as their surrogate because of the potential for exposure to radiation. Sure. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we go into psychological assessment. Everybody needs psychological assessment. And I don't want the surrogates to feel that they're the only ones who are targeted and not at all. Everybody involved in the process needs psychological assessment. The surrogate intended parents, if Mm -hmm. there's an egg donor, the egg donor, everybody does. And I want to emphasize it is not, the the intention is not to determine, are you a good surrogate? Mm -hmm. And to be judgmental, Mm -hmm. it's really more to make sure you understand the process. Mm -hmm. And many times they will bring topics that you probably never thought of. And just so you could stop and think about it and think about all the facets of surrogacy so that should you decide you want to move forward, you've thought about just about every potential issue so you can make an informed decision. Yes, okay? absolutely. Yeah. Once that preliminary part is done, and mm-hmm. a lot of that, of course, right, Carrie, as you know, as the agencies, you're able to really any surrogates with a really red flag, you guys are really able to weed those surrogates out. Okay? Yes. Mm-hmm. So of the remaining surrogates, then we do a deep dive into their medical history, which mm-hmm. means, and this is, boy, right, this is really such a frustrating part of the process, which is collecting all the medical records, which sometimes is tough, right, of the surrogates First pregnancy was 15 years ago. Well, good luck. Right? <laughs> right. right. Exactly. Right. And sometimes even with deliveries that were four years ago, sometimes it's just impossible to get those records. Right. But yeah. everybody does their due diligence to at least try. Right. Mm-hmm. 
And then once we get those records, we do a meticulous evaluation of every page of those records to make sure that no stone is left unturned, that every potential issue has been evaluated and assessed to make sure that we don't think this is a risk for the surrogate for the next pregnancy. Right. Right? This review of the records takes, it takes time. And especially for us, it truth be told, it takes about two to three weeks right now for us, which I know is such a long time. And it's so hard for surrogates to wait that long for agencies, for intended parents. Mm-hmm. And many times, right after we're, we've done this two to three week review, we then say, we need more information on this, yeah. more information on that which just only further delays the process. And I know it's so frustrating, but it's so important to keep the goal in mind, which is healthy surrogate, healthy baby. Yep. Okay. For sure. And then once we've done this very deep, detailed medical review, and this is where we actually exclude most of the surrogates. Okay. But should she pass that, then the surrogate comes in person for medical evaluation, which consists of talking to various people on the surrogacy screening team, physical examination, which includes vital signs, blood pressure, weight, mm-hmm. includes an examination of the uterus, mm-hmm. okay? And then of course, full physical exam. Yeah. And then blood test, urine test for different infectious diseases, mm-hmm. just general medical things such as anemia, your thyroid, immunity yeah. to viruses. Mm-hmm. And this also includes drug screen. Mm-hmm. Make, make sure that there are no, no evidence of drugs in the urine, in the body. Also includes smoking screen. Right. So we do our best to make sure she's as medically as possible. Right. Should the surrogate have a partner, the partner will also need to undergo not a physical exam, but blood and urine tests as well. Right. And if the partner can't come to the evaluation, that's okay. We could send a mobile unit out to where the partner is and get the testing done there. Right. Okay. That's great. And once all this is done, then we give medical clearance. So it's many weeks in the process. Yes, yes. So that is such a good description of everything that happens on the clinic side. And people, I don't think, quite understand when they apply to become a surrogate that they're not just going to sign up and get pregnant in a couple of weeks, that <laughs> there's a whole process that has to happen. And ultimately, at the end of the day, as you said, the goal is to make sure this is going to be medically and psychologically safe for the surrogate to go through this process so that at the end of the day, there's a healthy surrogate and a healthy baby. And that's really why everyone is being so incredibly careful and going through, you know, basically your life <laughs> with a fine tooth comb to make yeah. sure that this is truly going to be safe. So that gives us a really good idea of what happens on your side of things. And I think for a lot of people, it it gives it um, some credibility when it's not just people like me saying this is how it works. When, you know, the clinic is also saying, yes, here's what's really going on behind the scenes while you're waiting for all that time. Um, and actually two to three weeks isn't that bad. I've, I've heard of much worse and many long, much longer waiting times. So that's actually not that bad for records review. So, okay, great. So that helps, I think, a lot of people. So let's move on and shift gears a little bit. And let's talk about double embryo transfers. So when I started my agency 10 years ago, um, double embryo transfers were pretty common. Um, I would say over half of my intended parents did a double embryo transfer, which is when two embryos are transferred to the surrogate's uterus with the intention of having twins. So now here we are 10 years later, and almost none of the surrogates and intended parents have any interest in double embryo transfers or twins, and many of the clinics won't even do them anymore. So what is your position on this, and why do you think we've seen such a shift? 
Yep. So it's so interesting to watch this shift, Harry, because so I've been doing this 20 years now. And yeah. 20 years ago, just like you stated, boy, 20 years ago, I never, ever put one embryo in unless that was all the patient had. Right. It was mm-hmm. so normal to put in two, three, four. And the right. reason is back then, the success rates are not what they are now, right? So mm-hmm. you would put all these embryos in and just hope that something planted. Right, right, right. So much has changed in 20 years. The mm-hmm. success rate of IVF has remarkably improved. Mm-hmm. And back then, also, our freezing technique was so poor that mm-hmm. part of the reason why we put so many embryos in is because we had no confidence that if we froze your embryo, that it would survive the thaw months right. later, you needed it. Right. right. So right. that's why our mentality was just. Take it all, take as much as you can, right? Right. But now the freezing technique is so good that the success rates are the same between frozen and fresh embryos, which is why we freeze 99% of our embryos, right? right? Mm -hmm. So with the advancement of technology and the increase in success, clinically, we have shifted our mentality and our recommendations. So here are the risks of wanting to transfer to. So number one, it is very possible, and I get this question a lot, if you have two sperm sources, absolutely you can transfer one embryo from each sperm source and transfer into the surrogate at the same time. Some Mm -hmm. people believe that somehow the embryos, because they're from different sperm sources, will somehow counteract each other, and they won't, okay? Mm -hmm. However, there is no guarantee when we put in two that they will both implant. That's right. number one. Okay. Right. Two, there's the other extreme that there is a 3% chance an embryo will split. And that is the case whether we put in one embryo or two embryos. Mm-hmm. So if I put in two embryos, there's a possibility of triplets or quadruplets. Right. Right. So. In my 20 years, I've not had quadruples. I have had my fair share of triplets from transfer of two. So while we cannot force anybody to do what's called a selective reduction, which is where you go from three to two or three to one. Right. But when a surrogate is pregnant with triplets, we strongly advise that the surrogate and the intended parents have a serious conversation about selective reduction because pregnancies with three or more are incredibly complicated. Right. Okay. Yes. So mm-hmm. let's go back to two. Let's say she's pregnant with two. Yes. So some of the other challenges are number one, as you stated earlier, very few surrogates now want to be pregnant with twins. So mm-hmm. an intended parent will have to wait even longer to be presented with a surrogate who would be willing to carry two. Right. Two, not all surrogacy agencies will work with an intended parent who wants to transfer two. So now the intended parent's choices of agencies becomes restricted. Right. Three, medically, we are pretty stringent with surrogacy screening, but even more so when she's going to carry two because her potential for medical complications is much greater. So we need to be sure that while there's no perfect surrogate, that she really has as minimal risks as possible, meaning we're more likely to reject that potential surrogate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. She may be a great candidate for one embryo transfer, but not for two. Okay. Sure. Mm-hmm. And then medically during the pregnancy, the surrogate is a high risk for blood pressure issues, for diabetes. And these are because she's carrying two. Right. right. And the surrogate, of course, will be medicated. But if the medications do not work, mm-hmm. those twins will be prematurely delivered just to save yeah. that previous life, mm-hmm. okay? And premature delivery of twins comes with its own medical risks that nothing is ready. The heart, the brain, the lung, the intestine, nothing is fully formed. So the yeah. twin will be in the neonatal intensive mm-hmm. care unit. We call it the NICU, right? right? 
months and months. And the longer they're there, the greater the potential for future medical complications, including things you cannot diagnose, such as learning disabilities, which you only discover later. Yep. Yeah. Then it's there hard. Are, it is very hard. Yep. And then there are financial implications. Mm -hmm. If the surrogate is on bed rest because she's having these contractions and she cannot work, well, then the parents have to compensate her for that, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And tenant parents, many of whom, many of my tenant parents don't live in the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, if the babies are in the NICU for months, you need to have gotten baby insurance, which is very expensive for twins. And if you yes. do not, at the insurance now you are responsible to pay the hospital fee and in the united states one night stay in the nicu is somewhere between 15 to 20 thousand dollars a day it's very expensive her baby her baby right <laughs> so just financially if the pregnancy goes well wonderful if the pregnancy doesn't go well it can financially become incredibly expensive Yes. So yeah. having said all of this, people, people ask me, so why then do you still do double embryo transfers? Which I think is a very fair question. Yeah. And I still do double embryo transfers for a couple of reasons. So number one, I have had many, 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 many twins deliver and the vast majority of them have done fine. Mm -hmm. Twins finally deliver a month before their due date. So many of them will deliver at 36 weeks, at yeah. which time, the twins, believe it or not, are mature and ready to come out and rarely need to go to the NICU. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. The other thing is, and this may be counter to what I just said, but many times I have intended parents who say to me, we can only afford to do this once. This is a one-shot deal for us. So we yeah. just want the opportunity, realizing there's no guarantee, but just the opportunity to transfer one from each of us. And then it is what it is. We only have one, we have one. If right. we have two, we have two, but that is it. We we cannot afford to do a sibling journey, right? right? But I'm very, very strict about emphasizing, here are the risks. Do you fully understand the risks? And as long as I feel that they've understood and, mm -hmm. and they consented to it, then I feel comfortable moving forward to transfer. But it is sure. true, even in my own practice, Carrie, it's true. Like I used to do twins all the time and now it's oh. most of the time, yeah, it was trans one, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that makes perfect sense. And for people that are listening that might not, you know, quite understand what we're talking about when we say one from each of us. So a lot of intended parents are uh, two dads, same sex male couple, right? Who for obvious reasons need the help of a surrogate. So they have embryos that they've created with an egg donor and each of their sperm have fertilized the eggs, right? So you have one half, let's say of the embryos are from dad A and the other half are from dad B. And so dad A and dad B want to each have a biological connection to a child that they're having together. And so they'll oftentimes transfer one from each dad to the surrogate so that it's technically half sibling twins. <laughs> um, is technically biologically what it is, but yes, that's the majority of the cases I did as an agency owner. And as you said, a lot of them were fine, but it seemed like the ones that didn't go well went really, really bad and yes. really scary with long NICU, lots of complication, lots of bed rest, and just in general, very complicated. So it's like, you're either signing up for a pretty smooth ride or a really bumpy ride when you look at twins. Yep. And so now the trend, as I'm sure you've noticed, is, but again, this is expensive, is for people who can afford it, is they get two surrogates and try right. for one in each. Right. Yeah. So we're calling that parallel journeys or um, concurrent journeys um, where, yes, there are two surrogates transferring essentially around the same time frame so that there are two babies born from two separate surrogates around the same time. Yep. Yes, yep. we are seeing an increase in that. And that's for the overall safety of baby and surrogate. But as you mentioned, that's cost prohibitive for a lot of people. So 
that sheds a lot of light, I think, on double embryo transfers and, you know, a lot of reasons to not do it. But um, like you said, there are still clinics, including yours, that are still doing it for very valid reasons. So I think that's important to know as well. Mm -hmm. So while we're on this topic of embryo transfers, talk to me about bed rest. So I've been really curious about this as a former surrogate myself. Um, the clinic that I worked with a lot um, when I had my agency requires one full day of bed rest after a surrogate has an embryo transfer. So she has the embryo transferred and she literally needs to be laying down in a bed for 24 hours and not moving except to go to the restroom and shower. Whereas my embryo transfer that I personally did, I flew across the country, had the embryo transfer and was on a flight that night across the country back home and had zero bed rest and a huge day of travel. And it was a great pregnancy, healthy child who's now going to be 10 years old. So tell me about what is your clinic's policy on bed rest and why do you feel like there's such a variance out there? Yep, it's a great question. There is no scientific data proving that bed rest makes a difference. Mm -hmm. The day of the transfer is the day the embryo will implant. So mm -hmm. it makes sense that one would think, well, of course, that's the day that you should not be moving around because implantation will happen, which, by the way, you never feel implantation. Right. Okay? But the scientific data has proven that it makes no difference. Mm -hmm. so our clinic's policy is you don't need to be on bed rest. You can. We actually encourage the surrogates to stay at a hotel that night. And the next day, we tell them, please fly back home. But right. what we, that the day of the transfer, what we don't want them to do is do anything that exerts themselves. So we tell them, hey, don't get your heart rate up too much. So if you want to go for a walk, by all means, make it a stroll, but don't yeah. make it a speed walk. Mm -hmm. okay? Please mm -hmm. go out to dinner with your intended parents, with your partner, by yourself. But it's okay. You don't have to lay in bed. Okay. And sometimes, many times I get questions of, well, what about this? What about that? And the, my rule of thumb for people is if you do activity X, Y, Z, mm -hmm. and that test comes back negative, and you're mm -hmm. going to look back and say, man, I wonder if it was because I lifted something heavy or yeah. I did this, I did that. If you think you're going to possibly blame that activity for the negative outcome, then don't do it. Right. Okay? Sure. Mm -hmm. I do have surrogates who intentionally say, you know, I'm just going to rest in bed. I say, okay, great. No problem. Go back to the hotel and just turn on Netflix, catch up on all your movies, order room service. Fantastic. Right. And then other surrogates who say, gosh, I've never been to San Diego. Is it okay if I just go for a walk around the hotel? Absolutely. Right. Okay. Makes sense. So I'm going to ask you um, a little bit of a detailed question. So you said, you can do stuff, but don't exert yourself. Don't get your heart rate up too much. Why do you say that? Why is that important? So the reason why we said that is because patients would say to us, well, what does it mean to not exert yourself? Right? Okay. Gotcha. It's just so hard. So we tell them, hey, if you notice your heart rate is like faster than it normally is, then you shouldn't do it. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's say if you have to climb these steep stairs, go find the elevator and just take the elevator then. Got it. That's sort of of a Take it easy, basically. Yeah, don't. Yeah, I got it. That makes sense. Okay, so no scientific evidence. Basically, it's clinic by clinic. And what I have heard in the past, and maybe this is true or not, is that once a clinic has a protocol that they feel is working consistently and resulting in a really good success rate, it's like, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And so it's one of those things like we do bed rest, it's working for us, our success rates are great, we're not going to change it. It may or may not be scientifically proven, but it's working. Yep. I think that's a great point you bring up because many surrogates have experiences at different clinics. And sometimes, many times, these little protocol nuances are very different. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great attitude is rather than saying, well, this clinic is doing it wrong. And this right. clinic, the mentality should be, okay, there must be many ways of doing this. And mm -hmm. this clinic must do it for whatever reason. I'm just going to follow their protocol, even though it was different from what I did in my past journey. 
because right. yeah, we times we do a lot of stuff, just pure superstition. Yeah, yeah, sure. That makes sense. I get it. Absolutely. Okay. So let's um, switch gears again and talk just sort of in general for a surrogate's point of view. What do you wish as a medical professional, as a fertility clinic physician, what do you feel and wish that surrogates knew about the fertility clinic side of this whole process? Yep, that's a really good question. So one of the things that I would advise surrogates is when you fill out your application is to be as honest as possible. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know, you don't know, but to be as honest as possible, because sometimes when we go through all these records, so much medical information is unearthed. And sometimes surrogates say, oh, I didn't think that that was relevant, right? Mm -hmm. so the, the more honest you are up front, mm -hmm. the more efficient the process will become. Okay, because right. we discover something new, we then have to tell the agency who then has to ask a surrogate who that, right? As opposed to, oh, no, we knew this up front and here are the details of what happened. Okay? Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. And we know that you, we know you're not intentionally hiding, but really try mm -hmm. to think back. Gosh, did anything happen when I was pregnant back then? And really try to share as much information as possible. Right. I think the other thing surrogates need to understand is, you are giving these intended parents a gift that mm -hmm. without you would not be possible. And mm -hmm. they truly are grateful and they are seeking a partnership. But sometimes mm -hmm. things come up in your history that they may feel that, oh, I don't know. So I'll give you an example that happened last year. A mm -hmm. surrogate had a history of, of, as a teenager of suicidal ideation. She was mm -hmm. a teen, right? I mean, I think we've all had moments where a teenager where we're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm right. done, right? Yeah, yeah. And it was in her records, right? And I'm sure at that moment, it was just a teenager moment. Right. But things like that came up, which then, of course, I've had intended parents say, absolutely not. And I've had other intended parents say, she was a teenager. She is like right. 30 years older now, and she's totally yeah. fine. So Right. Things like that may come up, and it's not to be um, judgmental, but it's really more when we see stuff like that in the records, we can't just sweep it under the rug. It has to be brought up, be honest, mm -hmm. and let the intended parents just make the decision because they may say, I don't feel comfortable, but I guarantee you, as long as this is something that's not active and in the past, there will be intended parents for whom you will make their dream possible. Yeah, so true. I've I've often said surrogates when they're starting the process need to have a heart in the right place and a really thick skin because <laughs> there's going to be people picking through your entire life from every direction and that's just to get you to the point where you can actually be considered. <laughs> and so yeah. it's it's tough and I think that's a really good piece of insight for sure. And for us weight is a big issue. We mm -hmm. have been criticized. And again, I, I get it. We've had agencies say to us, you know, you guys are just too strict with your weight, weight criteria. And they may very well be right. But again, right, different clinics, different protocols. Don't fix something that's not broken. It's a winning formula. Let it be. Mm -hmm. And it's hard, right, Carrie, when you tell a surrogate who actually looks healthy. And I'm just like, wait, how could this be her BMI? I'm so surprised, right? Yeah. And we do have the honest conversation of, hey, we need you to lose some weight. We need you to be in a healthier space here if we want this to happen. And we're willing to wait for you until you reach X BMI. We right. will, but let's collectively work on this so that we can make this happen. And, you know, it takes thick skin to hear that kind of news. It does. Absolutely, it does. And I think it's important that people hear it, though. It's important. I mean, every clinic's going to have their own protocol. And if you're not um, on board with it, then you know, maybe not the right clinic for you, right? Mm -hmm. um, so like on the flip side of that, what do you wish intended parents or people looking maybe to start the process of becoming an intended parent? What do you wish they knew from the clinic side? Many intended parents 
I believe, start the journey with this very picturesque notion mm-hmm. of who the surrogate will be. And, and, and of course, everybody should start from that place. But as we go through the process, they start to realize that these are humans and right. there is no such thing as a perfect surrogate. Yes. And our collective goal is to find you a woman who is healthy enough to give you a healthy baby. Right. She may have a history of mild high blood pressure in the past. It was mild. Right. And may it occur again with her next pregnancy, which will be with your baby? Sure. But if it does, it'll probably be mild again. And if it's not mild, the doctors will deal with it. Right. But I will not exclude a surrogate just because she has this history of a mild medical condition. Right. There is no perfect surrogate. Yep. Right. And my other advice for them is many times intended parents really, but they're not sure what type of a relationship to have with the surrogate. Mm-hmm. And I really advise them to speak with the agency. Mm-hmm. But I tell them that it's a very important conversation to have because I've seen relationships where, my gosh, they're so close. They're, they've become BFFs and they text each other daily and check in on each other. And after the baby's born, they are still so close. Yep. And then we've seen the other extreme where it, there's barely a relationship. And you know, those kinds of relationships make me a bit sad because it just seems so transactional. Mm-hmm. I think it's nice to have a middle ground where maybe you text each other maybe three times a week or once a week. You don't have to be BFFs, but I think there should be some kind of good contact because you really are becoming a type of family. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think that once the intended parents establish that relationship with a surrogate, I think the relationship changes and they are more able to tolerate the ups and downs of the pregnancy and the surrogacy process, because again, nothing is perfect, because they view the surrogate as a partner in the process. And together, they go through the journey. Yes, 100%. Just like any relationship, right? You know, once you have that foundation of trust, um, then you can weather the storms that are very likely to come at some point. So great advice. I love that. Well, It has been such an honor speaking with you and getting to hear your perspective on all these things that, you know, we as surrogates or former surrogates or even agency owners, we talk about, we have our sort of, you know, vacuum and bubble of what we think, but it's nice to hear the the fertility clinic side of things. So thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us. Appreciate you. Oh, you're welcome. It was so much fun speaking with you, Carrie. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of the Normalized Surrogacy Podcast by Surrogacy Mentor. Again, I'm your host, Carrie Flamer-Powell, and I want to again thank Dr. Susanna Park of San Diego Fertility Center for joining me today. Be sure to check us out online at surrogacymentor.com if you're interested in knowing whether surrogacy might be right for you. Take our easy two-minute quiz on our website. Also check out modernparentmentor.com if you are considering an independent surrogacy journey as a surrogate or intended parent. Subscribe to this podcast to learn more about gestational surrogacy and how to have a safe, ethical, and enjoyable surrogacy journey. Talk to you next time.